Hello, uh, my name is Ronald Ben Israel. I'm a senior lecturer at K College of Education. As a cultural geographer, I'm interested in the relationships between space and consciousness. In recent years, I have focused on the special aspect of education and emphasizing pedagogy of place-based education. In my opinion, the importance of place-based pedagogy is always high, but especially now in light of the corona crisis in which the importance of the local community increases and the need for outdoor learning increases as well. The term purple mapping, which I've coined, is referring to Harold and the purple crayon. It is a wonderful children's story that was told to me as a child and that I told to my children who were little. Written by Crockett Johnson, it is a story of a little child that goes to a magical journey with his purple crayon. The space on which the story takes place is a product of Harold drawing by his magical pencil. So Harold is a baby who creates space and mapping it at the same time. Only after introspection does Harold finally arrive his beloved home and room. I will start with critical looking at modern mapping and modern pedagogy, and then I will analyze the principles of purple mapping as a tool in implementation of place-based education. The question regarding mapping that leads the critical geography discourse are, who does modern mapping serve? What are the relationships between mapping and power relations? Who does the mapping, ex the mapping exclude? And so on. It turns out that maps are not an exact reflection of space. Many times the mapping reflects the relationship of social and political forces. We see here the map of the world as burned into the mind and geographical imagination of millions around the world as the accepted and normative representation of the world. We have learned and internalized that the mapping is the privilege of strongest groups politically, culturally, and economically. See the inherent advantage that this representation gives to Europe, which located in the center of the map and see how small Africa is in relation to its real size. It seems that the modern mapping profession developed in the Western world and actually served it. We recognize the close built-in proximity between mapping institutions and state, and state in institutions such as the, the military and the intelligence. The critical discourse argued that modern mapping as a profession has focused too much on the mapping of the large space, the large scales, scales states, continents, etc. And at the same time, it detached from the experiential aspect of space, created and represented a frozen reality and, mini and magnified the product, the map, at the expense of the mapping process itself. The political bias of cartography text can be seen in this map. It is from my previous research. Now, it looks so real. It has a legend here, yes, and it has a scale bar here. However, a close look reveals that the Palestinian city of Hebron has undergone a Jewish renaming, a Jewish renaming of its streets and neighborhoods and it's done by the Jewish settlers as part of their political agenda. On the other side of the socio-political ladder in Israel, here is a photo again from my doctorate research. It was a study of the Bedouin space and Bedouin society in the Negev. This picture has been taken during a field research in which I spent a whole day with a man, this guy, 
in the area where he was born in the western Negev and from which he was expelled 60 years ago. Without a real paper map, this person was actually mapping the space of his ancestors by his body. He stepped and pointed and spoke and remembered and thus mapped such a meaningful space for him. So the question that this uh, um, critical discourse raises is, who has the right to map? How can mapping justice be done? Uh, so with this question in mind, let's look on several arguments of the critical pedagogy. Uh, I say that between the uh, critical geography and the critical pedagogy, there are some uh, lines that are uh, and let's say parallel or social researchers such as uh, Vygotsky, Ferrere, Hecht, Lampert, Bach, Glasner and others raised doubts about the validity of the Enlightenment myth wrapped around modern education. Moreover, they argue that modern industrial education is no longer relevant to our era. Why? Because it, pres it preserved the child's status as missing or incomplete or as a human becoming. Yes, because uh, the modern education promotes canonical knowledge rather than indigenous or local knowledge. Because it promotes a narrow range of intelligence, because it's boring, it's ir irrelevant to the, to the student's daily life and experience. So, uh, what, can, uh, what is the answer to this crisis? And I argue that place-based education is capable to deal with some aspect of this crisis. Here are some of the characters of PBE, and Clifford Knapp, David Greenwood, or Greenwald, and Gregory Smith are among the most fruitful authors at that approach. So, PBE is to think of education in terms of place. It's to promote the local knowledge. It's to understand that the student's daily environment is rich, important, and interesting, and therefore must play a key role in the formal education process. Basically, the the basic idea that the PBE promotes is to learn not just at the class. Uh, we can learn anywhere and anytime in any uh, position. We can go to the park, to the neighborhood, to the natural uh, area and to learn there. And there are a lot of benefits in this kind of pedagogy. And I argue that purple mapping may be an excellent tool for place-based pedagogy. To illustrate this, we will watch now uh, and the story. So, Harold and the Purple Crown by Crockett Johnson. One evening, after thinking it over for some time, Harold decided to go for a walk in the moonlight. There wasn't any moon, and Harold needed a moon for a walk in the moonlight. He needed something to walk on. He made a long straight path so he wouldn't get lost. And he set off on his path, taking his big purple crayon with him. But he didn't seem to be getting anywhere on the long straight path. So he left the path for a shortcut across the field. And the moon went with him. The shortcut led right to where Harold thought a forest ought to be. He didn't want to get lost in the woods, so he made a very small forest with just one tree in it. It turned out to be an apple tree. The apples would be very tasty, Harold thought, when they got big. So he put a frightening dragon under the tree to guard the apples. It was a terribly frightening dragon. It even frightened Harold. He backed away. His hand holding the purple crayon shook. Suddenly he realized what was happening. The 
but by then Harold was over his head in an ocean. He came up thinking fast, and in no time he was climbing aboard a trim little boat. He quickly sat down, and the moon sailed along with him. After he had sailed long enough, Harold made land without much trouble. He stepped ashore on the beach, wondering where he was. The sandy beach reminded Harold of picnics and the thought of picnics made him hungry, so he laid out a nice, simple picnic lunch. There is nothing but pie, but there were all nine kinds of pie that Harold liked best. When Harold finished his picnic, there was quite a lot left. He hated to see so much delicious pie go to waste. So Harold fought a very hungry moose and a deserving porcupine to finish it up. And off he went, looking for a hill to climb to see where he was. Harold knew that the higher up he went, the farther he could see, so he decided to make the hill into a mountain. If he went high enough, he thought, he could see the window of his bedroom. He was tired, and he felt he ought to be getting to bed. He hoped he could see his bedroom window from the top of the mountain. But as he looked down over the other side, he slipped, and there wasn't any other side of the mountain. He was falling in thin air, but luckily he kept his wits and his purple crown. He made a balloon and he grabbed onto it. He couldn't even see a house. So he made a house with windows, and he landed the balloon on the grass in the front yard. None of the windows was his window. He tried to think where his window ought to be. He made some more windows. He made a big building full of windows. He made lots of buildings full of windows. He made a whole city full of windows. But none of the windows was his window. He couldn't think where it might be. He decided to ask the policeman. The policeman pointed the way Harold was going anyway, but Harold thanked him. And he walked along with the moon, wishing he was in his room and in bed. Then suddenly, Harold remembered. He remembered where his bedroom window was when there was a moon. It was always bright around the moon. And then Harold made his bed. He got in it and he drew up the covers. The purple crayon dropped on the floor and Harold dropped. Okay, it's a wonderful story, and of course, uh, in contrast to the modern mapping, purple mapping means giving the power of mapping to the weak, to the one who is untrained, not to the professionals, and thus empowering him. Purple mapping is mapping small things. Not mapping the world or mapping the continent, rather mapping a small everyday things. The purple mapping offer us the possibility of mapping as doing as an ongoing process whose main value is in the making and in the working and less in the product. When the dragon that Harold had painted frightened him, his hand began to tremble, and so Harold began to drown in the sea. Here, through the mapping process, the internals become external. So purple mapping could be a wonderful tool for emotional working. Now relevance. Purple mapping is mapping things that do matter to the pupils and to the students. It is mapping their local environments, their places, places that have importance for them. And in the end, purple mapping can raise awareness or dilemmas in the community and the environment, and challenge social difficulties, and so forth. It is a wonderful practice to motivate, cultivate, collective thinking about ways to solve and improve 
what need to to uh, improvement. I will give now uh, several examples from two courses of mine that have some purple mapping elements. But before a few words about the institution, uh, K College is an academic institution for teacher training. The studies are for a bachelor and master degrees uh, and for obtaining a teacher, a teaching certificate. certificate. The college is located in the Negev. It has a leading role in making higher education accessible to the Bedouin population in the Negev. Today, over a third of all college students are Bedouin women. Uh, I will start with the course Get Up and Wonder. This is his name, yes? Uh, it's a course that aims to study the connection between movement and the geographical space. At first, the students learn about the connection between bodily movement and consciousness. Then, they go on a tour of the neighborhood and choose topics for research. After conducting the mini research, the students themselves give a presentation in the site in the neighborhood. So, um, now you can see um, several uh, pictures from the from this course. Um, one of the team uh, found this uh, local artist and actually his subject was um, art uh, creation in in very, let's say, low so socio-economical uh, um, level. Uh, the neighborhood which the college uh, is located in is among the most, um, let's say, a poor neighborhood in Israel. Um, so actually, you know, just wandering around and find and find this uh, amazing person that he actually create art. It was uh, um, quite uh, fascinating. Uh, here you can see on the slide the presentation that took place in a small flower shop. Uh, located in a small neighborhood shopping center. The subject of the study was the destruction of small shopping center following the opening of malls on the outskirts of the city. It's Friday at noon, the peak of shopping time. Despite everything, the store owner invites us to the store, into the store, to talk about himself and about the difficulties of running a business in the small business uh, complex. Immediately afterward, he takes out the guitar and we all uh, sing. During the course, information is processed with the help of neighborhood mapping and in-depth self-reflexive mapping. Students enrich the neighborhood, the neighborhood maps with more and more layers of meaning, knowledge and experience while learning about themselves. In the end, the students, most of whom do not live in the neighborhood, admit that for the first time they learn to get to know the, na the neighborhood where the college is located. Many of them testify to the dismantling of images and stigmas of the neighborhood and the construction of much more complex and rich picture of uh, reality regarding this space. Uh, here is another team that actually uh, study uh, this local park uh, in the west side of the neighborhood. The second, uh, um, the next course that I want to talk about is journey course. Journey course is, journey course is a field workshop that takes place in the desert for five days and nights. The pedagogy that underlies this course is the wilderness journey. Students disconnected from the network and from the city and live in a raw field condition and are required for tasks that consolidate them into a group. They acquire basic tools for field education activities. After the field workshop, 
the group of students spent another night and day at the desert hostel in order to make a conceptual and pedagogical processing of the field experience. Every year, many students report a journey course as a transformative experience which had opened up a new and fascinating pedagogical toolbox for, for them. I argue that place-based education is capable to deal with some aspects of the pedagogical uh, uh, crisis. And I gave two examples that actually using different uh, styles of purple mapping. And I think that we can learn something from this nice and interesting uh, children's story. Thank you very much.